this Tuesday night. You have illegal people coming into our country. We can't do that. We don't know who they are. As the U.S. president doubles down on his demand for a border wall, an eight-year-old Guatemalan boy dies in immigration custody, a personal tragedy that so quickly has become political. A royal family Christmas. Courtiers have been in firefighting mode, and so that body chemistry is going to be very, very interesting. Rumors of a rift have Sandringham under scrutiny. And Ryan's road to recovery and his courage in moving on. I'm sort of becoming more of accepting and, and being mindful of it, but not letting it get to me. The former humbled Bronco tells his story. This is The National. On this Christmas Day, the death of a young child has once again put the U.S. president's immigration policies in the spotlight. But tonight, there are very few details about what happened and who might be at fault. Let's start with what we know. An eight-year-old Guatemalan boy died this morning in hospital in New Mexico. The U.S. Department of Homeland Security says the boy, along with his father, was transferred from detention to hospital on Christmas Eve. The child initially diagnosed with a cold. Doctors later determined he had a fever and he was given antibiotics for the infection and ibuprofen for the fever and then returned to detention. But late last night, the boy began vomiting, was sent back to hospital and died shortly after midnight. We don't know the cause of death. U.S. authorities are launching a review and shortly after the news broke, the political fallout began. Democratic Senator Martin Heinrich tweeting, heartbroken and sickened by this news, I am urgently demanding more details, but the Trump administration must be held accountable for this child's death and all the lives they have put in danger with their intentional chaos and disregard for human life. The boy's death comes the day after a funeral service was held in Guatemala for seven-year-old Jacqueline McKean. She died in U.S. custody a few weeks ago. News of the second child's death came after President Trump spoke to reporters at the White House. He's in Washington for the holidays after cancelling a trip to Florida because of the government shutdown, now in its fourth day. And so the White House and Congress remain in that standoff over funding for Trump's border wall. Megan Fitzpatrick has the latest. Hello and Merry Christmas. Very special people. Thank you very much. President Donald Trump spent part of his Christmas Day sending holiday greetings to U.S. troops stationed abroad. But his Christmas spirit waned when reporters asked how long the government shutdown will drag on. I can't tell you when the government's going to be open. I can tell you it's not going to be open until we have a wall, a fence, whatever they'd like to call it. I'll call it whatever they want. Trump said he's been encouraged to stand firm by some of the 800,000 employees whose paychecks are on hold. But Twitter tells a different story. Using the hashtag shutdown stories, some workers are blaming the president for not knowing if they can pay rent or feed their family. Others worry about making their car payments on time. Trump also told reporters he has confidence in the U.S. economy, despite the recent stock market slump. But he kept up his criticism of the Federal Reserve. They're raising interest rates too fast. That's my opinion, but uh, I certainly have confidence, but I think it'll straighten. They're raising interest rates too fast because they think the economy is so good. But uh, I think that uh, they will get it pretty soon. I really do. He wrapped up his Christmas comments by railing against Democrats and former FBI Director James Comey. He once again denied any collusion with Russia and said if Democrats go after him in January, it would amount to presidential harassment. It's a disgrace what's happening in our country. But other than that, I wish everybody a very Merry Christmas. Thank you very much. Megan Fitzpatrick, CBC News, Washington. Canadian aid teams are heading to Indonesia. They'll be helping the roughly 16,000 people left homeless after Saturday's tsunami. But as Olivia Stefanovic shows us, there are Canadians worried about family members who are caught in the catastrophe and still haven't been found. It was supposed to be a celebratory Christmas Mass. But as parishioners arrived at this Indonesian evangelical service, it became clear the thoughts of loved ones back home weren't far from people's minds. I heard from my friend that they're still looking for their relatives. 
Darwin Sukihardo was one of those who came to pray for the victims of Saturday's tsunami. I was shocked because like I never thought that, you know, this would happen again, especially in Java. It's near to my hometown. This is the latest disaster uniting the Canadian Indonesian community, evoking not so distant memories. Just a few months ago, this woman raised money for the victims of the tsunami that struck Palu. Now she's planning to collect donations once again. My heart is breaking for the people over there. I don't, I can't even imagine what they're going through right now. As they stood in solidarity, so too did those directly affected. During the tsunami, we were in church rehearsing for today's mass, she says. There was no warning, so we tried to help whomever with whatever we had. The task, though, isn't easy. Rescue efforts have been hampered by rain and blocked roads. More than 150 are still missing, 1,400 injured and more than 400 dead. Back at the church, the shock is starting to wear off and the realization of what needs to be done is setting in. So we have strong com Indonesian community here. We, we, we bear one another's burden. Even though they're far away, this Canadian Indonesian community plans to continue to show its support well into the new year. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Mississauga, Ontario. The Queen acknowledged the challenges facing people in the world in her annual Christmas message. She called for peace and respect for others regardless of their differences. But it was the younger royals who drew attention as they arrived for morning church service on the Queen Sandringham estate. Friar Stewart reports. They lined up in the early hours of a chilly Christmas morning, all here to see the royals as they attended their annual church service. The Queen arrived without Prince Philip. It's been reported that the 97-year-old is in good health but decided to sit the service out. Many of the eyes, though, were on the younger royals, particularly the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, who are expecting their first child. Much has been said in the British press as of late about the relationship between Meghan and Kate, as well as between Harry and William, with some speculating there's an ongoing royal rift. Well, I think I'll probably be watching for what everyone else is watching for on Christmas Day, a show of unity. You know, these rift rumours haven't gone away for, for weeks now. Courtiers have been in firefighting mode, and so that body chemistry is going to be very, very interesting. But today it was all smiles amongst the group. After the church service, the dukes and duchesses took time to chat with some of those who had been waiting for hours, just for a moment like this. And then they were off to enjoy the rest of their Christmas traditions, including watching the Queen's annual message. Which was broadcast this afternoon. As part of it, the Queen made an appeal for unity. Even with the most deeply held differences, treating the other person with respect and as a fellow human being is always a good first step towards greater understanding. A message she undoubtedly hopes will resonate because once the holiday festivities are over, there will be more difficult conversations about Brexit and the very future of the UK. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. Pope Francis called for unity in his Christmas message at the Vatican, our first stop in this look at celebrations around the world. Tens of thousands stood in a sunny St. Peter's Square to hear the Pope's message of unity. Allora le nostre differenze non sono un danno o un pericolo, sono una ricchezza. A blend of the present and the past as tourists got out their tablets to capture morning mass at Bethlehem's Church of the Nativity, the place Christians consider the birthplace of Jesus. In India, sand and plastic bottles went into this giant Santa sculpture, and while it drew the curious, the country's Christian minority made their pilgrimage to Christmas services. From the sacred to the silly, this is the annual Santa swim in Germany. It's happened in Berlin as far back as 1980 when this lake was in East Germany. By the way, that water, just five degrees.
watching some news stories here in Canada this evening, including a vehicle crash in Saskatchewan which killed three people. It happened on Highway 10, that's just west of Melville. RCMP say it appears a pickup truck crossed the center line, collided with an SUV. All three victims were in that vehicle. A 16-year-old boy, 51-year-old woman and 48-year-old man. The driver, an 18-year-old woman, is in hospital while the truck driver was treated and released at the scene. A woman was shot and killed by a police officer in Calgary early this morning. Police say she led them on a car chase that lasted hours and that when they stopped her, the situation escalated quickly. Alberta's police watchdog is investigating. And thousands of people still in the dark in southwestern British Columbia. This just days after a strong windstorm swept through the area, knocking down trees and power lines. About 12,000 homes and businesses remain without power on Vancouver Island and the Gulf Islands. Some 800 field workers are out doing repairs, but BC Hydro says it'll be several more days before some people get those lights back on. Well, most of you watching had the day off, but a growing number of Canadians spend Christmas Day on the job. And it's not just essential services like hospitals or first responders. These days it includes retail as well. So why open up a full-size supermarket, for example, on Christmas Day? We went to one here in Vancouver to find out. This store was an early adopter in the world of Christmas retail. It's been open on this day for 21 years. When we first started Christmas Day, it was slow. Like, you could bowl down the aisles is how I like to put it. So who's going to the grocery store on Christmas? It's like the only one that's open, pretty much. Like the decent grocery store. I'm not going to go to a gas station. We're supposed to be making some smoked salmon pasta for our family dinner, and we didn't buy anything, so we're buying it now to make it in now. Remember those last-minute gift shoppers? Well, it seems some of them are last minute when it comes to food as well. You know, it's super busy and we get so many things to be done. And then you have the people who managed to go through all of their food already. Well, I was hungry yesterday, so I ate everything up. All my homies came. I'm like, it's not even Christmas and they ate all my food. And I opened the fridge just today and I had nothing in there. So I was like, I got to run to something that's open. Apparently, lots of the staff are happy to work on this day. They get time and a half. Some don't celebrate Christmas. And then there's the reaction from customers. They're, you wouldn't believe all the love I get on the phone when I say, they go, you're open. I go, yeah, you're, you're the best. You know, and so it, it's, it's, it's definitely a win-win. Still ahead on tonight's National, from Sinatra to the King of Pop, my interview with legendary music producer Quincy Jones. But for Susan Ormiston's extraordinary access to an extraordinary young man, what came after the humble bus crash? What did it feel like today on that treadmill? I tried my best to do what I could. Did you see him give up? Never. Let's go, let's go, big, big, big. Another grueling day of physio for Ryan Strzhnitsky. The former player with the Humboldt Broncos has been coming to this Calgary clinic for six months. He was paralyzed in that devastating bus crash, and he's been working hard to build up his strength. The Broncos lost 16 players and staff members when their team bus was hit by a semi-trailer last April. Ryan was one of 13 survivors. He and his family gave the national Susan Ormiston extraordinary access to track his rehabilitation. And on this Christmas Day, here's a reminder of what resilience and courage look like. This is Ryan's story. All right, that means it's recording. Ryan's room, 1019, pretty funny, because he was number 10. It's May 7th, uh, just after 8.35. Uh, on the agenda today, I got physio and maybe a couple visitors, but we'll let you know what goes on during the day. It's been a month since the Broncos crash. If you feel like you can let go and bring one hand onto your legs. Ryan Stretznitsky is just beginning his long therapy regimen. Today, a seemingly simple task kind of takes forward. immense effort. Big to my ankles? Yep. You're really flexible. Can you pick that leg up and cross your ankles? Good. Nice. 
So this, like you can see if you had a pair of shorts or something like that, you got your foot free so you can hook it over there. Okay. Yeah. Then bring it back and try it over. Yep. Okay. Oh, it's heavy. <laughs> Legs are really heavy. Yeah. Ryan was thrown from the team bus. His spinal injury was to his mid-back, paralyzing his legs and his trunk from the mid-chest down. Is this your first time doing this yeah. with a sock? Yeah. Jesus. Even this much effort fatigues him. Do you want a pillow? I don't know. Yeah, okay. God. Yes. Make mom cry. Way to go, no, buddy. The horrifying crash between the hockey team's bus and a transport truck changed 30 lives forever. 15 Broncos players and staff died, along with the bus driver. The truck driver faces multiple charges of manslaughter. Ryan and 12 of his teammates survived, but they are left foraging through the trauma. We first got to know Ryan through his mom, Michelle, less than 48 hours after the crash. Better than average chance that he won't play hockey again, or possibly even walk, we're not sure. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Finally. Yeah. We caught up with Ryan himself a few weeks later, after he was transferred to Foothills Medical Center in Calgary. What have been some of the most difficult moments for you? Like not being able to, like, sorry. If it's too tough, don't worry. Okay. Yeah. Just not being able to go to the funerals. Uh, it's May 14th, uh, new week, more physio, and the CLD goes. Six weeks into recovery, Ryan is working on his upper body and core strength, even just to roll over and sit up. Nice. Balance is tricky. So what happened is angling your bum this way and then lifting your legs in one at a time. The other yep. All the way in. Beautiful. Yep. So very well. Nice. Yep. And you want the legs to go that way? Yep. Good. There you go. Nice step. Ready? Okay. Can you go? Beautiful. Nice. Okay. Dad Tom is recording every development. Turn the camera on. Hey, just focus. Capture this. Ryan was the firstborn to Michelle and Tom. Twins Jet and Jaden followed, and then baby Connor. Ryan worked his way up the hockey ladder, Bantam, then Midget AAA with the Leduc Oil Kings before he joined the Broncos last year. It's uh, May 18th today. We have a couple physio sessions. Uh, Erica, my girlfriend, arrived <laughs> last night. And yeah, we're just, just kind of staying for the long weekend. Ryan met Erica Burns from Montmartre, Saskatchewan, just two months before the crash. A teammate introduced them. On that horrible night, she got to the hospital before his parents, and she's been loyal ever since. Still, the two of them are now embarking on a relationship neither could have ever imagined. It's now end of May. Ryan's parents are packing him up at the hospital. Hello. Now, the nursing staff are saying you're, you're quite good at transferring over from bed to bed and shuffling and assisting. <laughs> They've taken an offer from the Shriners Charity to go to a renowned rehab hospital in Philadelphia, all paid. The family thinks he can progress faster there. They're still holding out hope. He might regain sensation in his legs, maybe even walk again. The Shriners Hospital in Philadelphia becomes Ryan's new training camp. Pool time. Including a first session in the pool. More. But that sense of weightlessness feels like freedom. The hey, Marin's going under this time, buddy. Even if he's afraid he'll sink. Yeah. 
How'd you feel? Ryan's on a mission. Today, the exercise with physiotherapist Kristen Cray is falling backwards. What to do? Now what? I'm going to take all the spits. <laughs> I don't know, but this feels weird. It feels really weird, doesn't yeah. it? You protected your head, so you're good. All right, so here, hold the front ends of the frame here. You can hold yourself in the chair. Yeah. He'll need to instruct people to help him get upright, and it's not easy. I like to say that we're working on the fundamentals and the foundation of transfers and sitting balance and rolling, just rolling over from left to right and then, okay, I'm on my side, how do I sit up? And now in your wheelchair, you can push across a linoleum surface of the hospital, but can you push across the sidewalk that is not level and has bumps? Okay, now push forward, push forward, push forward, push forward, okay. You've described him, others have as a star student. Yeah. In some respects. Have you seen frustration? every once in a while and um, he channels it uh, in different ways where he'll just be quiet about something or um, he's just left, like let me do left, that again left, 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 left. Oh, there better not be a six inch curve anywhere else did you see him give up never this week or next week we've got a lot to work on huh yeah you don't change them after an injury they are the same person they were before the injury and so you see that carry through in their rehab and their activities beyond um, the hospital setting. Part of the challenge is to avoid complete atrophy of leg muscles. So to encourage movement, they need to manipulate his legs, putting him first in a harness in preparation for a treadmill. Go up a little more. How's it feel pulling on you up top, Ryan? Like, do you feel it against your chest or your shoulder? As Kristen Cray and her team simulate a walking movement, Ryan watches himself standing upright for the first time since the crash. What did it feel like today on that treadmill? Uh, it was surreal. I mean, just being able to see yourself walk again. It was pretty cool. I mean, I tried my best to do what I could, try to move my legs, but I mean, they, they did it for me and hopefully it'll help in the long run. When you came down here, what was your hope? Uh, just to be more independent, you know, um, obviously, you know, every guy wants to walk again and but I was just coming here hoping to get stronger, just being able to adapt to a new way of life. Joining us on stage right now, the humble Broncos. Motivating Ryan all this time was a trip to the NHL Awards in Las Vegas, a physical and mental challenge. It was the first time he'd seen most of the surviving Broncos since those critical days in hospital. It was fantastic. It was like being in a locker room again. It's almost like time froze and you're just enjoying the moment. Did you cry? No, I, I can't cry in front of the guys, but uh, no, it was definitely emotional and it was a good time. So did you talk, did you? Oh yeah, we talked about everything. Um, you know, how, how things were going, what their plan is for the future. I know nobody can really experience what we experienced and we know each other too well, so. Um, it's, it's just good to lean on them. The attention doesn't stop with Vegas. The Broncos touch so many internationally. In Philadelphia, Ryan becomes a bit of a local celebrity. Ryan Stasbinski. The Phillies honor him as their special guest. I had a nice time about you. We're just so happy to have you guys. Thank you. Take a video, Mom. It's all very heady. Private tour. Exciting and unexpected. But when the spotlight goes away, there are the unavoidable reminders of loss. Tom is Ryan's chief cheerleader, counsel, and life coach. Gets me is just looking at him, what he used to be able to do three months ago to what he can't do now. Is, it kind of hits me on that one, but then I just look forward and go, let's work a different corner, work a different path, and we can get through it. Look. What frustrates him? Uh, staring at his legs and <clears throat> trying to make a move, but they can't move. Oh, and what really frustrates him is not being able to move his core. And well, deep down, we know it's the people that he lost, his teammates and all that. But Still? still oh, yeah, every day. Really? Yeah.
It's now early July, time to go home, but not before a visit to Philadelphia's iconic monument to fighting back, the Rocky Steps. The story of how the underdog boxer Rocky Balboa fought his way up is not lost on Ryan. Lots of ruts in those paving stones. Oh, you okay there, buddy? Or? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Here's our test, I guess. Yeah. Ryan probably imagined tearing up here two steps at a time once. It's different now. What an insight into how challenging all of this has been. And coming up after the break, Ryan's not fully healed, but he has taken to heart the idea that he's not defined by his legs. I think everything I've worked up to, you know, it just keeps keeps going and going. I keep getting better and better. I'm sort of becoming more of accepting and, and being mindful of it, but not letting it get to me. In July, Ryan comes back to Alberta on a commercial flight, moving easily now in his wheelchair. The hometown media is waiting. So welcome home, how's it feel? But Ryan can't go home yet. The family home he grew up in is waiting, but it needs a major renovation to make it accessible. What's this? That's great. Somebody made that from all the sticks they put around the hockey rink oh, just up here. That's cool. And then he dropped it off. So you're going to renovate this house? Wow. Yes. This is hockey house. Memorabilia everywhere. This is hockey house. <laughs> Did you push Ryan into hockey? Um, started him and learned to skate. And then he hated it. And then we got him into hockey, hated it. And then he slowly started to like it. So I said, okay, let's go. Any regrets? No. No. Because hockey teaches you life. Teaches you teamwork. Teaches you what the world's going to be like and how to deal with things. So. In spades now. Oh, big time. Look at all the support he got. Hi there. Hey, Stewie. Hey. Ever since the night of the crash, family friend TJ Stewart has been a rock. So, uh, I'll give you some updates on what's going on here, Tom. All right, buddy. So first you organize neighbors to gut the basement. Uh, your elevator, of course, is going to be installed in the garage. It's going and helped raise nearly $200,000 for uh, rehab and the reno, including offers of building materials. But it's going to take months. So, Ryan and his family move into the Wingate Hotel in Airdrie. Nice to meet you. Welcome. For as long as they need to, courtesy of the hotel's owner. Get your own Pepsi. Ryan takes the accessible ground floor room. Oh, look at the family. The three other kids and their parents split two other rooms. Michelle is essentially running a house in a hotel. There are days when I just, I kind of miss the simplicity of just going to work and coming home and not having all of the craziness. It's really hard. It's awkward. It's very awkward, but we're getting there. The lobby has become their living and dining rooms. Tom calls it Strasgate, not Wingate. The changes to their family life are really settling in now especially for Ryan. The days that he doesn't have physio, I think, are the hardest for him because he doesn't know what to do with himself. Um, I think just the enormity of, of what he's facing is, is hitting him sometimes, but there are other times when I know he, he feels, yeah, a little bit left behind, I think. Okay, can we, we just need to move that, Tom, can you lift that thing? I'll slide you back just a tiny bit. Yeah. I'm just gonna lift you Ryan up. is happiest yeah. heading back Fast to the ball. ice. So don't try and just hammer the puck, right? For the first time, wearing the Broncos helmet and gloves, yeah. sledge hockey veterans talked up the sport right back in the sport. first few weeks after the crash. They've got their eye on Ryan as a potential Team Canada player, maybe. Erica, his girlfriend, is moving from Saskatchewan to Alberta to be with him. I'm going to fall. Yeah, you will. You look like a hockey player. Summer is fading. Any other year, Ryan would have been at hockey camp by now. 
How's the nerves today? Okay. Instead, Tom helps get the day going. It's Thursday, August 23rd. I uh, woke up, the nerves weren't too bad today. Um, Sunday, Erica moves in, so I'm pretty excited for that. Five months ago, he couldn't even raise himself out of bed. This is real progress. His morning routine can take an hour and a half, but now dad can leave. And Ryan's just a 19-year-old again, with things to do and his independence coming back. His scars aren't fully healed, outside or inside. But he has taken to heart the idea that he is not defined by his legs. I think everything I've worked up to, you know, it just keeps, keeps going and going. I keep getting better and better. What's been the worst thing? Um, I think just the distance from everyone. I mean, everyone's going away for hockey or, and or school, but now you got to kind of figure out what to do now because, I mean, everyone's lives has been changed. So, I mean, I usually think about it every day. It takes a while. I think it's never going to leave my mind, to be honest, but... Um, do you ever get angry still? Not really, no. I'm sort of becoming more of accepting and, and being mindful of it, but not letting it get to me. You're not going back to Humboldt for the first game? No, I, I won't be able to make it, I don't think. Why? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I love the Broncos, and the organization was amazing. I just I don't want to, you know, watch the team that I should be playing on right now. So um, I wish them all the best of luck and, and, and everything during the season, but I, I just don't think I can go watch. Just too hard? I think so, yeah. Back in May, socks were the goal. Ryan's mastered a whole lot of life skills since then. I mean, it's only been five months and, and look where I am now. And the energy that fueled his ambition in hockey is being rerouted. We haven't heard the last from this former humble Bronco, number 10. By the way, the Strzhnitsky family is spending the holiday at that hotel in Airdrie. The renovations on their home not yet finished. And since we first ran that story, Ryan and Erica have parted ways. Ryan continues to make extraordinary progress. He's playing a lot of sledge hockey. But coming home from physio a couple of weeks ago, the van he was riding in was rear-ended. It threw him to the floor and shook him up badly, but didn't keep him down. As Susan said, and we have no doubt, we haven't heard the last of Ryan. Well, next on The National, we're going to take another look at a recent conversation I had with Quincy Jones. As a composer and producer, he's helped megastars get better, even the king of pop. Michael sent me a note. Could you please take off the violins in the introduction? No, it's messed up my groove. You know what that line was? Diddle, 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 diddle. The identifying line on the goddamn song. Quincy Jones, a legendary composer and producer, has reached yet another career milestone. This month, his name appeared on a record 80th Grammy nomination. It's for the music documentary made by his daughter and another filmmaker, and it's a powerful reminder of just how much he's accomplished. Appropriately called Quincy, the movie chronicles his life and the indelible impact he had on the sound of a generation across all genres. Music was the one thing that offered me my freedom. For seven decades, Jones' fingerprints have been all over so many iconic recordings. From Frank Sinatra to Michael Jackson. And he's credited with making TV stars out of Oprah Winfrey and Will Smith. His influence remains too, inspiring new artists like Lady Gaga Quincy's here. and Kendrick Lamar. Quincy Jones, boy. And who could forget? the world one of the fastest selling singles of all time <laughs> we talked about a lot of that when i sat down with him at tiff beginning with growing up so far away from the world of music uh, 
I read you grew up in a rough neighborhood and yep. rough circumstances, and, and I'm the sure the 30s that, in Chicago. Yeah, and I'm sure some of your friends, you at the time, took the wrong path. How did yes, they did? And they're gone. How did you end up in well, music? Because I wanted to be a gangster too, you know. Yeah. Because kids, you want to be what you see. You know, my father was an architect for the most notorious black gangsters in the history of America, the Jones Boys. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be a gangster until I was 11, a serious gangster. Because I saw Tommy guns every day. Wow. Uh, uh, dead bodies, stogies, piles of money in back rooms, the drinks of wine and liquor, you know. Unbelievable, man. So when did it change, your, your It dreams? changed when I went moved to Bremerton. And we were baby gangsters at 11 years old, and we wanted to take that place over. And we had to, you know, the kind of, we believed in the experience enough to do it. We ran all the stores, steal everything in there, <laughs> and we broke into the armory, which was our recreation hall right next to an army camp in our house, and individually went to the separate rooms to break in the offices. And I broke in one with a piano, and I left it. And something said, idiot, go back in that room. And I went back in the room and went over to the piano and touched it, because I didn't realize human beings played that stuff. I heard it all my life. And it told me right then, this is what you do the rest of your life. No lessons before you touched that no, piano? No, but the next day I went back to Coons High, Junior High School and studied sousaphone, tuba, B-flat baritone, E-flat alto, French horn, trombone, to play in the marching band with the majorettes. I was going to say, because those are tough instruments then for a kid to, to learn. I know, but man, I love brass. You know? yeah. That's why I like to write for bass and brass, you know. Yeah. Love it. So love it. I only got 10 minutes with you, so we got to cover some of the okay. big names, right? Just shut up. No, 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 not at all. No, but I'm just going to make sure I get there. Frank Sinatra, did you still wear the ring that, that he gave you? Wow. The rest of my life. It's one of the greatest guys I've ever met in my life. I would like to have you meet a gentleman who's been doing these marvelous orchestrations for me, Mr. Quincy Jones. Right here. Joe, Mr. Quincy Jones. One of the bright young stars in the orchestrating business. Q, go ahead. And I think some people watching might not know the connection between you and Sinatra. Tell yeah, us. Yeah, it tell was us very, that. very powerful. Uh, one thing to me illustrates it as strongly as anything else, and that's uh, he was married to Mia Farrell about a year and a half. And uh, she went to London, and so did I. She'd just done Rosemary's Baby. I was going to do an uh, Italian job for Michael Caine, the score. And my son was born there, and so Mia notified Frank that I had a son born in London in 68 or 69. And so when I get back to Los Angeles, all this mail from the Academy, on top of it, Sinatra Enterprises. And Sinatra's letter to me said, it wasn't to me, it was to my son, Q3. So I called my son QD3, because I'm junior. My father was senior. And let me welcome you to this world with a college education. Uh and he used to put a bond in there to pay for my, my son's entire college education. And he said, no, it'll be a far better world than the one we messed up. He's got that on his wall now. That's a real friend. Because okay. Frank was the most devoted, loving friend you could ask for. He had no gray. He'd roll over you in a Mack truck in reverse, <laughs> if it were the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but when he, he was, was devoted, a real he was friend, devoted. man, real friend. Real friend, always. So, let's talk about Michael Jackson. I mean, you know, all of us have Thriller, many yeah. of us have yeah. Off the no, Wall. It's an amazing experience, man, because Michael was a very, very special talent. I mean, really special in every way, in observation, influences, and dancing, and singing, everything. He didn't miss a thing, you know. I remember on The Wiz when I first met him, he knew everybody's lines, he knew their songs, he knew their dance steps, everything. So Thriller had seven top ten singles, right? It dominated yeah. the charts yep. in a way that no oh, album ever yeah. had before. 110 albums, million albums. When you were in the studio doing it, were there any moments where you thought to yourself, did you have any idea what, what impact that album was going to have? I don't think of it like that. I think about what touches me. 
You know, I've never in my life ever done music for money or fame. Never and never will, because God walks out of the room then. And it's not sacred anymore. And it is sacred, you know, because to me, melody is God's voice. It's clothed by lyrics, but melody is God's voice. That's the power. But I always wonder, so when you did the playback for Billie Jean, or for any of the songs on there, was there a moment where you said to yourself, we've done something different, special here. No, but that was the whole plan in the beginning, man. When you go through 800 songs to get nine, that's not casual, you know? That, and that's what you're aiming for. My least favorite numbers are two, six, and 11. <laughs> you've been talking about I got a top six record, and if you're number two, you want to be number one, Yeah. right? So. So we know a lot about Michael Jackson, and you were just talking about him. What on those albums, Thriller, for example, is you? You know, you have his music, some of his writing, no, no, some no, of man, his but look, We take his stuff and take it to another level. Don't stop till you get enough. I, it's, it's very well known that Michael sent me a note. Could you please take off the violins in the introduction? No, it's messed up my groove. You know what that line was? Diddle, 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 diddle. Yeah. The identifying line on the goddamn song. So he said, take it off? Yeah. And you said? No way. I thought, you don't tell me what to do. No. Mm -mm. Who was right? Well, who, what, what ended up on the record? Yeah. <laughs> That's one of the strongest parts of the introduction. Little, 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 with Ben Wright. Yeah. Ben Wright wrote that. This was a Motown arranger. Let's talk about We Are the World one of the best-selling records of all time. There have been lots of other groups that have done similar songs, including here in Canada. Uh, first of all, that line, Park Your Ego at the Door, that you put up in a sign, who came up with that? I did, but it wasn't necessary. They came in for the right reasons. They really did. They came there to give back. And that's, you know, it wasn't necessary. We are the Is there a lot of politics trying to figure out who would do which vocals and yeah, how to balance Yeah, and it? also just placement, all, yeah. all kind of stuff, yeah. Who and I take had care to, of that? Well, I had to take care of telling 46 people only 21 could sing solos. Yeah. That was not popular at all. I mean, they were freaking out, man. Who did you have to say no to? Well, I don't want to get into that. <laughs> but you can imagine that. <laughs> and her limousine and bodyguards and Springsteen comes in a pickup truck, you know. We are the world. We they didn't need to hear Tricky goes to the door. They came to the right reason because they saw each other and they got it, you know. They really did. Our time's up, so one last thing. What's, uh, what's next for you? Ten movies, six albums, four Broadway shows, no. two, two networks. We're in business with Donatella Versace with Q's Jazz Lounge and Bell Juice Juke Joint in 25 hotels, $700 million hotels around the world. It's just unbelievable what's happened. I got a huge company in Dubai, Lapa Dhabi. So you're retired. That is your father. No, I'm never retired. <laughs> not even, I've never been so busy in my life, man. I'm 85, you know. You are an impressive man. Really nice meeting you. You too, brother. Thanks. You're a good movie star, man. <laughs> good God. Have you done movies? No, no. You I, should, man. Anyway, that is fantastic. I really appreciate it. And I've been a should, man. huge fan of uh, a lot of your work, so that's very cool. Thank you, All man. All right. You're on to your next uh, interview. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank fantastic. You, you appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Beautiful cat. Over the holidays, we're taking another look at some of the powerful images of the year, taking you behind the lens to hear from the people who captured them. Tonight, videographer Jared Thomas talks about Susan Ormiston's story on climate change shot in Canada's far north. I'd be lying if I didn't say that there's a few times I would let my camera roll and I'd just step back and just kind of take a deep breath and just kind of take it all in. And take one. So 
I got the amazing opportunity to go to the Yukon this year and shoot up on the glaciers with uh, Susan Ormiston. A lot of times, you know, you're looking for that yeah, that close up, that detail to really bring a viewer into the, the story that you're trying to tell. But on this shoot, it just felt like every shot that I was trying to, to, to get is like, it felt that it was needed to be the wide shot to really tell the story. I think when I went to the Yukon, I was just trying to continuously think about how can I bring this to the viewer that they might have not seen before. One of the things I actually ended up doing was I brought a gimbal, which is like a small little stabilizer that can make your camera feel like it's floating. And for one of the scenes that we shot, I just used that the whole time because you can kind of move with the subjects and they were measuring um, ice depth across the glaciers. And it kind of gave a sense of, you know, when you're following along, you get a sense, oh, these are the crevices that they have to walk through. And oh, maybe that's a lot steeper than I thought it actually was. Or you know, I, you know, I'll be lying if I didn't kind of slip a few times. It kind of showed that it was also, you know, very icy and slippery as well. So I felt that that was the best way to give people perspective. Acts like a dam and impounds the water. If I don't have the right shots for Susan, she's not able to write the story properly. And it doesn't really like, you know, we, we really do need to work as a team so that, you know, in an, especially in an important story like the climate change happening in Canada, if I don't have those proper shots, then Susan's not going to be able to write the script that really tells the story properly. And hopefully saw that super with our YouTube channel. There is a lot of material on there, including some more of those behind the lens features. That is the national for this Christmas day from Vancouver. Thank you very much for watching and Merry Christmas.